and we are live. It's your right. show, Abby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Epic Series. I you probably can't see my face, but I'll show my face at the end of this whole presentation. Um, so just I'll jump right into it. Um, a lot of professional advice is aimed at novelists, um, and it doesn't really apply to writers of epic series. So the approach, the plotting, the methodology, the audience building strategies, the marketing differs between standalone novels and epic series. So I thought it would be a good idea to discuss those differences and go in with eyes wide open. Oh, no, there we go. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm just a Wattpad star. I've got some regular readers, 65,000 plus reads on my ongoing series with a new chapter posted every Saturday since 2017. And that is an ongoing thing and I'll probably be doing it until 2023. Um, advanced chapters are on Patreon. So I've been published in a few magazines and Writer's Digest books. Um, I've been a guest on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy podcast, which is hosted by Wired Magazine, co-host of another podcast. Um, I've had a career in video games where I did some content writing as well as art direction. And um, I I'm also an alumni of the Odyssey Writing Workshop and the Superstars Writing Seminar, um, which <clears throat> those are really awesome workshops. So I'll just have to plug them towards the end. Um, so let's see. And also I'm involved with a lot of sci-fi writing communities. So you can ask me later if you'd like to know about any resources or local groups. So you probably all heard plotter or pantser. That's kind of like a common thing in the novel writing world. In the series world, it's like kind of like, well, there's a spectrum. Where does daydreaming fit in? Um, like I've kind of heard the term maladaptive daydreamer. And I think that's what I was throughout childhood. Um, so for Epic series, I think of necessity, it's a blend and the pantser versus plotter dichotomy doesn't really apply very well. Um, you know, an Epic story is too big and too dynamic for an outline to nail it all down until after it's completed. Um, but it's also too complex with too many moving parts to be handled as a pantser, unless you've, you're writing a quest or a journey type of adventure with like a no framework or that sort of thing. Um, so I know like labels are annoying, nobody likes categories, um, but I do think the type of series matters and this whole affects your whole approach, your management of expectations, story structure and all that. Um, so here's like, I've got kind of four categories of series and I think this is something people don't really think about, but there really are, um, like there really are quite a lot of different types of series. So this type is like one big story um, with a promised ending. So these are like Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Game of Thrones, Wheel of Time, like all these big name series you can see on the screen. Um, and of course, I'm sure there's some I'm forgetting. These are kind of like, a bit one big story it has the most potential to gain popularity these are some major ips and it's also my personal favorite and it's the type that my series on wattpad is um but it's also the most labor intensive type by far so i believe that these projects get abandoned and unfinished the most often these are the biggest risk and the biggest reward kind of projects um so, you know, this is like episodic kind of books that could be read out of order. That's another type of series. Um, you know, you probably recognize Sherlock Holmes, Nancy Drew, Anita Blake, like all these detective novels. I would say that also paranormal romance and urban fantasy fit into this. Um, I just don't read a lot of paranormal romance or fantasy or sorry, urban fantasy. So I can't really speak too much to the romance side of things. Um, I realize there are many more fam famous examples, but I didn't want to include books I hadn't read. So I would say fully contained episodic series are much like standalone books. 
I'm not really going to cover those in this workshop. Like there's plenty of advice for standalone novels out there and episodic series are basically standalones. Um, now this type here, um, like, so we've got Oz, Outlander, The Bulgariad, Warriors, Umbrella Academy, you know, <laughs> the Vorquizigan saga. Um, these are kind of like an ongoing series that readers maybe keep wanting more of. And there's no concrete expectation of a final ending. Like there was never kind of an overarching framework or a setup where the readers are expecting like, okay, they're gonna get Sauron in the end. Um, or they're, you know, they're not gonna face Darth Vader in the end. It, there's no like expectation at the end. Um, I think that, you know, like for this kind of series, the first books, like first books of, of Oz and a first book of Outlander, they kind of work as standalones and they set up, um, they set up a big framework, but the later books become, became pure adventure. So like, I'm not sure if I'm on the right slide here. No, I'm not. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, Okay. Sorry, my presenter notes are a little bit out of order here. Um, okay, well, anyway. So framework type of sort series can be loose and even swapped for one another. Um, the Expanse TV series, for instance, had the promise of a mystery to be solved throughout the first few seasons. And then the framework switched to a space terrorist bad guy who needed to be killed. Um, the series with a loose framework of prophecy or mystery is like a hybrid of one big epic story plus a casually ongoing quest. And I think a lot of these start as standalones that grew legs and began to run. These are also likely fun projects, although they might turn into a slog or a mess if you avoid addressing the mystery or whatever the framework is. Okay, that's actually the next one here. So yeah, Harry Potter, Narnia, The Walking Dead, um, The Dark Tower, like these are all pretty big IPs as well. Um, so yeah, the, I'm <laughs> sorry for my notes being out of order. Um, but anyway, yeah. So like, I'd just say basically some of these can be kind of blended between these two. Um, so you've got like an expectation of an ending. You've got kind of a framework here where Harry Potter, it's like, well, the, the framework is he's going to defeat Voldemort in the end, but everything within that is kind of an episode. Um, same thing with the Dark Tower. It's like, well, in the end, they're going to get to the Dark Tower. But within that, um, there's a, it's pretty loose. It can be kind of an adventure. And same with Narnia. Like, I mean, you know, like in the end, they're probably going to get back to the real world to England. Um, but it's pretty loose within that. So um, I think those are kind of like the four types of big epic series. Um, yeah, so if you're writing the big story series, or even sometimes if you're just writing some other kind of series, it's very easy to underestimate how enormous these projects are. Like best-selling authors make it look like it was a piece of cake for them, but check out how few series those household names are known for. Um, you know, like Robert Jordan's known for one series. George R. R. Martin's known for one series. These projects take a decade or even a lifetime. They're not standalones. <laughs> so wrap your head around that. <laughs> oh yeah thanks for saying um shout out to lewis mcmaster bejold yeah i know i've like i've read all of these and i really enjoy them oh. sorry like i am not sure why my notes are so out of order here um, <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. Well, I'll just say, like, I guess I didn't put any notes on this one. Um, so yeah, like Michael J. Sullivan made a conscious decision to complete his epic Ryria series before releasing it to the public. Um, I found that effective as well. So I do have readers I serialize online before official publication. 
I believe Sullivan did the same seven plus years ago on Wattpad. Um, keeping the books in a beta stage allows me to course correct and revise earlier books whenever I get lost in the weeds. I need to make a major change to the story. You'll notice that like other big story writers kind of are unable to course correct because they've been publishing as they go. Um, and I believe that's one of the main reasons why George R. R. Martin and Patrick Rothfuss seem stymied in finishing their epic series. Um, yeah. So yeah, how do you sustain your writing career while writing a series? Because it's such a big project. Um, so I was gonna ask like, how many of you are in the planning or beginning stages of your writing, of writing your first series? I'm not sure. I can actually read the chat, so feel free. <laughs> Um, and how many of you have completed a series? And if so, what category was it? Framework, no framework or very big story. Um, you know, and how long did it take you from pre-production to completion of the final draft? <laughs> yeah, and since the finish, the finish line can be years away, like how do you sustain that? Um, so I've seen a fun approach, like where writers turn their careers kind of serious later on. So put another way, should you publish as you go, a la online serialization or a la relaxed or amateur self-publication? Should you build a buffer in order to capitalize on the rapid release? Should you turn the series into a back burner project while you focus on building your writing career in other ways? What works best? Um, I mean, I feel free to tell me because <laughs> yeah, it's all like a learning process and I'm kind of like fumbling around as I go as well. Um, I think I've tried all of these approaches. <laughs> so managing the reader expectations, that's one of the biggest things, you know, people have a little bit of trouble with cliffhanger endings. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, Andrew. I understand completely. Mine is seven books and they're completed, but I'm not releasing them yet. I'm still doing the online serialization thing for a little while longer. Um, but I think that that's like one of the best ways to do it. It's, but it sure is a big project. So like in Western style storytelling, a major story question is presented early on, such as will they survive? Will they escape? Will they defeat the bad guy? So consumers are kind of commonly trained by films, TV, books, et cetera, to expect a satisfying yet inevitable conclusion. The reader expects an answer to the story question by the end of the book. In a series, I think an elegant way to handle things is to answer that original story question while also presenting a new story question to set up the next book. You know, or you can signal or early on that the reader should not expect an answer to the main problem or question which was presented. So like a disappointing cliffhanger or bad ending is when the author signaled probably subconsciously that the novel would have a satisfying ending. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so since structure and plot are highly individual, there isn't much journalized advice I would offer. It really depends on what you're writing exactly. Some genres have their own tropes and conventions and reader expectations. And sometimes it's good to smash conventions and create your own. <laughs> Some series set up a core or backstory situation using a prologue, and these became so poorly used, a whole bunch of traditional publishing gatekeepers are turned off to prologues forever. Uh, there are common complaints from series readers, such as cliffhanger endings and complete series, abandoned main characters, getting lost in the weeds, unfocused plot, unsatisfying endings, bland love triangles, weak villains, <clears throat> and you can feel free to jump in with your own. But yeah, like I have here, like, these are some of my main characters in my series. You can see the central three. Those are the main hero point of view characters. And this is just an example of like multi point of view. Um, the blue ones are villains. The pink ones are kind of underused and they're ones that I added later on. So like the ones that are kind of like a pink or small point of view there, it's like some of them, like, I don't know if you can see the pointer, but this guy, I didn't even add his point of view until book seven and it's just, it's like, you know, I really wasn't going to, but it, it became necessary at that point. So yeah, they grow, the story grows in the telling. 
So I found that like many standalone novels use a three act story structure. And I think that a four act structure can work better for series installments. So not only does it give you a breathing room, it also empowers you to set up the sequel and to give the, keep the story flow moving and the reader addicted. I analyzed the structure I used for each of the seven books in my epic series. So, so in book four, for instance, that's one of the middle books. It's like the story question set up is, will they avoid condemning the Alishani? Um, you know, part two, time is running out for the hostages. They can't find the Lady of Sorrow. The flood is unleashed. Things are getting really dark and grim. Part three. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, sorry, there's like a little bit of a delayed reaction here, but I'm, I am reading your comments. Um, part three is like, resurrected Lady of Sorrow empowers, empowers heroes to save people, but the Torth are gonna kill everyone. So stakes are being raised, always escalating. Um, and then we have a new problem prop cropping up. And then in part four of that book, the main hero saves everyone, but now he's in a death coma and the Torth Empire has declared war on him. So it kind of opens up the problem for the next book. I did have to make a final ex an exception for the final book in the series, of course, since there can't be a new problem at the end of it. I ended up with three climax resolutions at the very end, including a final boss battle, kind of fifth act. There were also about eight chapters of wrap up parties, justice served, final roles in a wedding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. Like the, those point of views, man, like I had a few like one offs as well, like a random slave kind of seeing what the heroes are doing type of thing. I found that they do kind of add a lot to it, though. I, like I've had reader comments that they did like that a lot. So I don't know. I, it really just depends on the handling. But for the most part, I do try to stick to the main three main characters. Oop. Um multi point of view challenges. Yeah. So this is probably stuff y'all know, but like, yeah, there's pre-production work involved with creating any major character. And unlike standalones, you might be juggling more than a few major characters. So some people have trouble giving them unique or individual voices. Others have trouble creating strong villains. I find that character contrast is the most important and can bring them to life. The same with interpersonal power dynamics or friendship and love dynamics. I think that's one of the biggest strengths of series is to have those like interpersonal dynamics. They just cannot like flower or flourish in a standalone book. I feel like having an ongoing series, you really get to dig into like these crazy power dynamics or romance dynamics. And it's a lot of fun. So story Bibles. Okay. So this is all about managing the complexity. So I'll tell anybody starting a series, <laughs> Even if you think it's manageable at first, it's going to explode in complexity. Um, I think it would take like a superhuman brain to remember all the details. TV shows use a story Bible. So, you know, consider how you want to set up your story Bible. This is definitely highly individual to the type of series you're writing. I use a tool called, called Dynalist.io and I'm going to just plug it because I think it's a really awesome tool. And you can see here like, in the slide, this kind of is showing you a little glimpse. It's all like collapsible lists. And I uncollapsed one of the shortest lists I have. Um, penitent characters, which are a kind of subset of the Torth. And, you know, I just have a list of those. All of these are, are expandable lists. So I can very quickly look up a random minor character and remember what I was talking about if I'm on book seven and I'm like, what was that character in book three and what did they say and what was their role? There was something, you know, it was a servant of all. And so I have to like, I'll go through the list and I'll find it. Um, so like including in all of that, I've also got a language I made up. This is actually not mine. This is a map for a fantasy novel that somebody else had. So I just thought I'd share because I know a lot of people do maps. And for my next series, I'm probably going to do a map. This is the power chart of the power magic system for my series. So yeah, quite a lot of stuff there. Um, yeah, so 
this is just more of the Dynalist examples, different planets. I've got a timeline. In my particular timeline, it's there's like a current year, which is when the whole series begins. And then I've got a plus one and plus two for additional years. And I've got kind of like rough dates so I can see how many months or weeks have passed between each major event. Um, so that kind of helps me keep track of the ages as each event is happening. Um, so every series has its own priorities. You'll generally need something to manage characters, something to manage locations, something to manage the timeline. You might also need the maps, glossaries, a magic system, lists of spaceship classes, and things like that. <laughs> Inca mate. Oh, that's an interesting one. So I've never heard of that. I'll have to look into it. <laughs> pink screwdriver. Yeah, her name is actually the pink screwdriver. <laughs> and she is a sexy character. Okay, so if you're an unknown author in the slush pile, they mostly are the gatekeepers of the traditionally published industry. They want either standalone books or a standalone with series potential. They, the literary agents are generally less on board with prologues and multi point of view and other hallmarks of an epic series. Um, so anyone who's tried pitching their series to traditional publishing has probably realized it's very difficult. You might also have noticed the big series authors you've heard of. You know, they either got started before Amazon KDP shook up the industry, they established themselves as capable novelists before selling their series, or they self-published and built an audience online before landing a big contract. So it is definitely very difficult. Um, I believe that traditional publishing is currently undervaluing the high risk, high reward, type, high reward type of epic series, the big stories that set up and aim towards an anticipated satisfying ending. The first book of those types of series tend not to work very well as standalones. And also you may have heard that a lot of literary agents and acquisition editors are quitting this year. So breaking into traditional publishing is harder than ever. So there's the poster boy for indie publishing, Hugh Howey. Um, so you could kind of skip the traditionally published industry, traditional publishing industry and go on indie. But, you know, <laughs> there's financial hurdles there and they are compounded for epic series. So, you know, if you want to approach your career like a professional indie author, you will need to commission a book cover artist and an audiobook narrator for the whole series, depending on where, which route you take. This is actually the route I'm planning to take eventually. Um, so I do it for the love, but I would also say it's not all downside. If you build up a great series that you're proud of, then you have a very powerful backlist. And that could be a substantial advantage that many debut authors lack, whether they're indie or big four published. So what do you do with your backlist? How do you gain a readership? How do you monetize it? Um, I've seen series authors gain readership momentum through online serialization and then capitalize on that by selling advanced chapters on Patreon or advanced books on Gumroad. And there's other platforms out there like Later Press. And later on, they can then reach another audience by self-publishing on Amazon. And that's kind of the route I'm taking. So. There are drawbacks to online serialization. For instance, some major literary agents, big four publishers won't touch something that has appeared online since they will consider it previously published. Um, posting online opens you up to possible plagiarism, theft, predatory contract offers. It's a dangerous world out there. So it's good to stay informed and kind of like research these various platforms. If you ever get like a nice offer online that seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, I do really enjoy getting votes on my chapters though. And I really just love having readers. So I think in some ways it really can be worth it. It just depends what you want. Um, let's see, yeah. And yeah, there's thousands of serialization and monetization platforms out there. I keep a list on my website. 
and it's that URL right here. Um, yeah, so monetization, fandoms, and serious addiction. So there's plenty of seminars and books out there about digital marketing. When it comes to series, I'll say that I believe there's an addiction factor that kicks in for readers, and that should not be underestimated or overlooked. Addiction is what you want, and that's where the fandom happens. Like, there was a time between the release of each Wheel of Time book that Wattmania was a very popular website. People have met their spouses on that site and gotten married. People name their kids and pets after Wheel of Time characters. I will chime in and say that my husband and I kind of met each other and bonded over the Wheel of Time. Um, you know, there's ongoing conventions for the Wheel of Time, although the author is deceased. So that is addiction. That's fandom. And that kind of hardcore devoted fan base doesn't happen for standalone novels, I believe. It takes a series. So there's a point where receiving one chapter per week is going to be painfully slow for readers, and a reader will want to pay to read ahead. So that's not going to happen with the first, say, 20 chapters, because they're not fully immersed and addicted yet. They can, they can quit at any time. Um, I usually judge things by the rate someone is voting on chapters. Like a very slow reader is likely to peter out and quit. I get excited when I see a reader who is speeding up. And I generally see them speed up at the end of book one if they're going to do so. So book one is just, you know, it's imperfect. And I've learned to live with that. That's the book where readers are deciding whether or not they will trust me as an author. Um, so just of my own 100 plus regular readers on Wattpad, seven to 10 read my weekly post as soon as it drops. Those are the really supportive ones. Maybe 30 more read it throughout the week. They're pretty hardcore as well. And then there are maybe 12 who catch up every few weeks. So those are ones that are oh, they're not really obsessed. And then, you know, I expect another 40 will catch up once they mark the book as complete and start the next one. And those are readers who have self-control, not hardcore addicts. Um, and by the way, I'm saying all this a little tongue in cheek because I also am a book addict and a series addict. You know, I read a lot of series. Um, and there's always like kind of invisible readers who don't vote or comment, so I don't know who they are. Um, right here, <laughs> fan support. It's a major variable in the success of a series. So readers who can wait are, to read are just much less likely to pay to read ahead. Um, and these are pictures, George R. R. Martin, Scott Sigler, two of my favorites. Um, I just mentioned this, like, so also Royal Road. Um, the Royal Road Big Shots, who earn six-figure annual salary on Patreon, like you might have heard of some of these people, they have something like 200,000 regular readers, which is quite a lot more than my 100. So I want to get there, of course. Um, but I also kind of wonder if it's a right time, right place kind of situation before Royal Road got flooded. Because so much of this industry is about hitting things at the right time. Um, so for instance, like newcomers to Wattpad right now, have a much, much harder time gaining an audience than the ones who showed up in 2013 to 2017. The user base alone grew from 65 million to 90 million after 2017. So 10% of those users are writers. Um, I also think the heavy hitters in the indie and serial world put some work into cultivating their audience. Um, like Scott Sigler calls his fans as junkies. There's a Wattpad author who addresses her fans as fluffs. And she's like, hi, I have fluffs. From what I see, the heavy hitters spend a lot of time being accessible online, joking around with fans, posting interesting articles, and that's a factor as well. Um, so since it may be a decade plus project, how do you incorporate writing a series as part of your daily lifestyle? You know, so in other words, like you might not see the reader addiction kick in until the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth book. Your family and friends might think you're just a failure for many years. It's kind of the experience of a lot of epic series writers. Like, I know it's not just me. Um, so, you know, specific to series. Um, I think there's kind of like a whole art to managing your expectations about how this kind of a career works. And I found that for me, writing in a vacuum is just poison. It turned out that I needed external validation for the long haul. And that validation doesn't have to be awards or peer praise or financial profits. It can simply be readers telling me that what I write truly matters. And that's all. Uh, but without that, I wither and procrastinate and angst about my writing career. 
And what made a difference in my daily sense of fulfillment was kind of to find a husband that loves my writing and find ways to build a regular readership online. And that's what really matters to me. But I don't think that what worked for me is a panacea for everyone. I think it's important to get to the root of why you write and what truly matters to you. So how do you arrange for critical beta readers who will stick with your series through multiple sequels? So <laughs> like you, you probably have realized if you have been writing epic series for a while, it is pretty difficult to find readers that are gonna stick with it the whole way. Any way of creating a series that has a satisfying opener and closure for each book, but that continues in a satisfying way. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, I think that's that's kind of like one of those like framework series where they're like, you know, with Harry Potter, or like there's Voldemort at the end that he has to defeat and every installment is kind of bringing it closer. And that was very structured as well as the super powered series by Drew Hayes. He did the same type of thing where it's like a school setting. Um, so it's very structured in between. And I think that can help to have that kind of a framework or a structure. Um, you know, another way, like with the wheel of time, he did it with kind of a final boss battle at the end of each book. Although he kind of fell off of that later in the series, but in the beginning there was like, there's an expectation of a final battle with the dark one. But between that, every book ended with Rand fighting, facing down one of the Forsaken. So that's another kind of like framework way to handle it. So again, it's, I think it's all about like setting up the reader, the, the story question, and then a way to answer it at the end. So getting back to like beta readers, um, yeah, hard to find them. Um, one avenue is to swap with other writers. And I did find a great beta reader group by establishing my own novel critique group with other serious novel writers. Uh, several members of that group also write series. And we used, we used basically professional workshop critique techniques, which is sandwiching critical feedback between praise, giving each person a set time to speak, that sort of thing. <laughs> a mini climax at each book's end is almost a minimum multiple goals resolved at different points. Yeah, I agree. Although I've, I've seen some that just are kind of an ongoing thing to some degree. Um, like I'd say Shorta Loon's series, which was like one of the Gamelet series. It's kind of like leveling up, leveling up, leveling up. And then it, he might have kind of like a, oh, he got to this level by the end and then it's more leveling up in the next book. So. I've seen it kind of work even without that with the Oz series as well. You know, they're on an adventure and it's just more adventuring every installment. Same with the Belgaria series. So there are ways to get around the mini climax at the end of each book, but I personally like the mini climax thing. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, so professional workshops, that's actually a really old picture of me and you can see George R. R. Martin in the middle of that photo. And that's the Odyssey writing workshop, which I attended in 2004. And I met a lot of really awesome writers there, some of whom I'm still friends with to this day. Um, and I just thought that was a really well-run workshop. So it still exists, they, they, it is still operated every year. They invite a professional working best-selling author to be a guest speaker every time. However, some of these workshops, such as Odyssey, Viable Paradise, Clarion West, Tao's Toolbox, Milford Writers Workshop, these are kind of like a money and time commitment. So I'm going to go on here and we can see there's free online alternatives. And I would say like some of these have zero membership requirements, so they kind of get inundated with newbie writers. And if you're looking for more experienced writers to hang out with online, I recommend Codex. It does have a membership requirement. A lot of it, a lot of the members belong to the SFWA. You don't have to be an SFWA member to belong to Codex. You can, um, I think the, min the minimum membership is like you, 
would have gone through Odyssey or one of those workshops, or you've sold a cumulative amount adding up to $100 USD of your fiction. So I don't think those are really stringent requirements. And I, I'd say it's a pretty good community. I enjoy being part of it. Um, the rest of these I can't speak to as much. I have been in them on and off, some of them. I can definitely recommend some discords for writers if you're interested, um, for indie authors and for various online serialization platforms and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm on Discord a lot. So, yeah. <laughs> I guess I can finally stop presenting. I'm not sure I did the best job there, but I'm going to say any questions. Oh, oh and I closed my laptop. There we go. Do you have a good view of the chat still? Yes, I do. All right, awesome. Then I uh, won't intervene much <laughs> or at all. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, that was that was excellent. So um, as we're waiting for questions to come in and everyone now is a great time, go ahead. There's a delay between us and you. So um, go ahead and type in questions as you uh, are thinking of them. And um, I will distract Abby while you do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to say right now, like this mark on my neck is from surgery. I just had surgery yesterday. So oh my goodness. Wondering, yeah. If you're wondering why I look a little strange, that's why. You may get the prize for like uh, most hardcore um, workshop <laughs> running. <laughs> like, like oh, I just had surgery yesterday, but it's cool. I'm here. I'm running. I'm leading a workshop. No big deal. Life has to go um, on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it does. We also had Allegra Pescatore was um, passing out all day from a condition that she deals with constantly, but like she was passing out more than usual oh, um, and still did her reading tonight. So maybe, I don't know, you two can have a competition. I know you want to arm wrestle or something. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone is asking if you can share the clickable Discord links somewhere. Um, yes, actually, uh, either one of us could add them to the permanent comments, or actually, you can type them into the YouTube chat if you have act if you're we'll keep looking at that. But um, or I can if you want to. Yeah. Let me um see if I can get back. Oh wait. <laughs> Hold on. I don't need to do it this way. Okay. <laughs> um, and Discord is really, I find really good for writing communities. Um, I think I kind of struggled to find you know, writing communities that I felt were, I don't know, the right level of interactive for me um, until I joined some, some Discord communities. Um, then they can be really great. Um, so yeah i'm gonna add the epic series um discord which is the one that i run myself nice um there it is yeah now other ones um not sure i should as freely share them and it really just depends oh yeah some of them are private for. yeah sorry no no some of them are i was just saying some of them are private i don't know uh but uh like I did that, I did yeah. that by accident one time. I, I was in a part of a, a NaNoWriMo discord that was so, people were, you know, so enthusiastic and cheering each other on. It didn't even occur to me that it was a limited, like invitation only discord because I couldn't even remember how I'd gotten there. <laughs> right. I shared the invite one time and then I was like, oh no, I've done a bad thing. Um, yeah, it's hard to remember which are private and which aren't. Right, yeah. Um, but yeah, that is, I mean, I don't know. I find that's one of the biggest challenges is part of why we run QuarantCon is just to give people a chance to talk to other authors because we're such, we're such uh, reclusive creatures a lot of the time. <laughs> and it's really nice to just hang out with people and talk shop and talk not shop. And, you know, um, this is very true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I enjoy it too. And especially since like, I am not leaving the house lately. Hmm. um due to yeah. medical issues so yeah, yeah sure um uh, yeah so let's see 
Um, how much planning do I like to do? Mm. <laughs> More planning than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I did think like a very organized uh, planner you had there <laughs> earlier. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm a crazy planner. I mean, so I'm actually writing a standalone novel right now just for the hell of it. Mm -hmm. um and yeah I I wrote an outline for that as well and I don't generally stick to the outline but I'll just kind of re-outline it (laughs) as I go (laughs) well you know if that's how you feel about it that's great (laughs) yeah and I'll I'll do like a giant brainstorm for names for titles Mm -hmm. for everything so I I know I'm pretty sure I overthink this stuff and I probably slow myself down and trip myself up Mm. but yeah I feel like you, you, you wind up slowing down one way or the other, right? Like I, I'm a personally, I'm a pantser and I love it, but it, you know, there's more work later on, you know, like I can dive into a story right away and get running, but then eventually I'll hit a point where I'm like, okay, now I really have to sit down and think out the details behind this and untangle this issue I've created, or even just, you know, did like, you know, I'll find myself stuck somewhere and it ultimately is a question of motivation. And so as long as I actually assess the character's motivation, I can untangle it, but it's just, you do, you do the same amount of work eventually. It's just a question of when I think. (laughs) Um, And yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I agree. There's always, there's always something. Yeah. (laughs) We all get tripped up somewhere. I mean, (laughs) yeah. Um, Yeah, I think instead of planner, <laughs> oh, <laughs> plotter was plotter versus pantser <laughs> or <Yeah>. planeswalker. <laughs> Honestly, I'm kind of tired of those terms. Like I, it's like yeah. I said, like I think those terms they kind of apply if you're writing short stories and standalone novels, but for series, it ends up being a blend no matter what you do. I think. Mm, true. <laughs> <laughs> like even if you're a pantser, like eventually you're gonna it's going to explode in complexity to the point where you have to have a series Bible and you're going to have to. Oh, for sure. And I, that's the thing is I feel like a a series Bible is a very different thing from an outline. Like I have, I use a timeline. I use Aeon timeline for my series and I use, I have copious world building notes, like hundreds of thousands of words of, of, of world building notes that, you know, never actually see the light of the story, but yeah, you have to, but I'm a pantser. So, you know, I just, I wind up like, sitting down and typing out a bunch of random notes <laughs> and then yeah. mo- and then moving on with the story <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and like, for me it's like I'll I'll plan it till the cows come home I'll have like a great <laughs> outline that's like I'll, I'll rewrite the outline 10 million times yeah um but then like I go for these long walks and I daydream the mm. series I daydream each each um what the next chapter is going to be about how it's going to play out yeah and I'll play it over and over in my head and I'll make changes in in my head on the fly. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So the stuff changes as I go for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It does seem a bit outdated to like the whole pantser plotter. And also, I mean, not outdated, just like it's never been as accurate as we want it to be. We like categories and then, you know, nothing ever really fits that neatly into them. (laughs) Pretty much. Yeah. (laughs) Cause everyone I talk to has some little mix, right? They've got, you know, like, well, I'm a plotter, but I do this, or well, I'm a I'm a pantser, but I do this. And and sometimes it varies from story to story, you know, like what worked for the last book doesn't always work for the next one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, for me, it's been like an ongoing thing. I, I've got to say, like, I rewrote the first three books of my series, or the first two books really, like 800 times. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, like, because I didn't know what I was doing and I definitely bit off more than I could chew. And I was very young at the time. Fair. Um, <laughs> so I was like, ah, I have this really big epic series. I'm going to write it. It's going to be no problem. It looks really easy. You know, like all the, all my favorite authors did it so easily. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love that. Right. You're like, yeah. I mean, obviously like, you know, it turned out so well, of course it was easy to do like, oh, ha ha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The magic back behind in those the curtain. Days. Yeah. <laughs> it did look easy right you know you read these, right. these other series and you're like well they just it, it was no problem for them right well, yeah it only they took didn't. them 10 years yeah. 
they didn't seem to struggle with it at all from my perspective here on the other side of these book pages. (laughs) Yeah, no, I feel like we all have that moment. We're like, oh, look at how effortlessly this was done. You're like, well, (laughs) turns out. Um, Yeah, Yeah, and then like I I got, um, (laughs) uh, yeah, it it became, I I got stuck in the mire. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, and then I was like bending over backwards trying to trace please traditional publishing um oh, oh yeah that was a trap <laughs> that was a trap that was a trap for sure um <laughs> so then you know i kept rethinking like what if i age my character up maybe they will like it better then <laughs> um, <laughs> and, sorry i'm just laughing i know i know so many people who've had that particular problem in chad pub they're just like uh sorry it's so <laughs> true yeah yeah so yeah and i was like tearing my hair out like like you know oh I, I know I just know it's my query letter I know <laughs> um, yeah. I, I've honestly come to the conclusion it wasn't my query letter <laughs> I mean it could have been it's but it's just so I mean you can play that guessing game for as long as you want I guess <laughs> you can I, I think it's honestly that they are really just a, a, like a one one big story epic series is not going to sell to traditional mm. publishing right now um I mean, maybe somewhere, somehow someone did it, but yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. I don't know. That's the thing, right? You always, some agents or, and people seem to be and publishers on the lookout for like the next whatever earth shattering thing. And, you know, we all like to think that's our book, but it's not most of our books. Like, (laughs) like, what are we, you know? um, And it's also not, there are two things that sell. One is one is like earth shattering and the other is comfortable. And <laughs> that's but, true. <laughs> um, and I feel like indie's a great place to like figure out what might be earth shattering because you can, if you get it wrong, it'll, you can still find your niche audience. <laughs> that is so true. Yeah. Like I keep saying, it's like traditional publishing is chasing trends and indie kind of some indie authors are setting trends. Yeah. Um, and I so prefer to set trends. Like I am not a trend chaser. I know it's well it's so much time and then just like hoping you hit that timing right and with trad pub it's an ever shifting goalpost and you're waiting so long to hear back from people how do you even do it you're like oh yeah this was on trend when I first started subbing it five years ago but now um and I say this as someone who has never ever pursued trad pub with novels I just did it with short stories you're wise yeah (laughs) I don't know if I'm wise. I just was, I was too much of a control freak from the start. I was like, wait, I, I have the choice. And actually, I love that you used Hugh Howey for your, for your slideshow. Cause like he was the person whose advice I took in deciding to go indie. Cause as I was sitting down, like, okay, I have a couple books that are potentially publishable. How am I going to do this? Am I going to hop on the, the, the trad sub wagon or am I going to go indie? And it was Hugh Howey's advice that made me decide to go indie um, on his blog. And and just like the idea that I would have absolute control over things like my covers and my the rights to all my um, the options and all that stuff. Just, you know, um, not that I've like <laughs> turned that into a massively profitable thing yet, but uh, it's certainly, I don't know, I find it fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. I mean, yeah, like I'm, I have to say like, yeah, I'm nervous about the whole marketing thing with mm. going indie that that has kept me from diving into that you know and so, there's a lot of people who keep asking me like why aren't you published yet like how like how long are you gonna wait just publish them already you know? <laughs> <laughs> well it's nice that you have impatient uh, readers <laughs> yeah well it's not just the readers I'm for it's my family you know my, oh, my right. parents and all that of course you know <laughs> um why haven't you done it yet um <laughs> Yeah, I don't really listen to them. Yeah, fair. <laughs> yeah, but oh, as I sit here with my wheel of time cup here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but but like I'm enjoying the journey. I guess it's yeah. it's fun to like kind of gain a readership and try to do it that way. It's a good idea too, honestly. Like I. I kind of wish that I had known more about Wattpad back when I started um, or any other place where serialization is common. Um, Wattpad was kind of the big one that might, that was available at the time. And I just didn't, didn't know anybody who was doing it. I didn't really know much about it. And um, 
And then sort of belatedly after I'd already started publishing was like, oh, maybe I should try doing web serials and stuff. But then I'd always get distracted by the next like full length book that I wanted to write. And I think I managed, I serialized the very first Victoria Marmot book and that was it. Um, and I did that mostly on Patreon because I was like, oh, okay, wait, I'm, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it this way. And, but then I got, I, I get really anxious about um, feeling like I owe people stuff. And so like I, I felt um, I wasn't really able to produce well on Patreon because I, for, for a web serial, because I was just, I kept getting caught up in stressing myself out like, oh, I have to do this and I have to do it now. And well, if I, I don't mean, do it, I'm going to, you know, disappoint people, the, like five people. <laughs> that's but, kind of how it is. But I don't think Patreon's really set up very well for series. For web series. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's probably, that's true. Um, but I didn't really know that or I thought I could. Well, it was actually when I started doing it, it was Patreon was pretty new. It wasn't really set up for much except I mean, it was, it was sort of set up for anything and no, nothing in particular. Right. They're, yeah. They're adding some new features that are supposed to make sort of web serials a, a more easily achieved thing there. Um, I hope so. Well, there's a competitor to them called Later Press, which I'm going to try yeah, out. That's cool. Yeah. Like, I'm, but I, the way I see it, like for me, I want to be able to sell bundles of chapters, mm-hmm. like advanced chapters, and Patreon just doesn't allow that. And it's very annoying. Yeah. Have you looked into um, the Kindle web serial setup, Bella? Yeah, I'm not impressed. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, hard agree. There's a lot to be left, uh, <laughs> a lot to be desired there. Um, but interestingly, I, I'm like the main thing I'm waiting on for them to do is to actually make Vela readable on a Kindle, <laughs> which at least now you can do it in the app, which you couldn't at the time. Um, but uh, that might help. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, because personally, like one of the main reasons I don't read web series right now is because I can't read on a computer screen. It gives me a headache every time. So I have to read. I have to, like I use my paperweight all the time. And if I could read, if I could read web serials on my Kindle, I would read the heck out of them. <laughs> like, I love them. I just can only read like a chapter and then I have to stop. Um, I want to let you like add, address more things in the chat. If as they're coming up, I'll stop talking. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. I mean, I mean, yeah, like I, I, I agree. But for me, one of the biggest problems I think with Vela is just the, um, they, they have a paywall or like they, they want people to start paying after three chapters. Only right. three. Well, that's not enough for addiction to set in. Right. That's and so, point. yeah. So I just think, honestly, the, the platform is never going to take off the way they wanted to. Yeah. With, with that attitude. They are currently paying very generously for giving it a go, though. Um, I know. Oh. <laughs> well, you know what, though? I was, yeah, I was doing it for the bonuses for a while, but they stopped yeah. paying me bonuses because I had zero readers on there. What? Oh, yep. well, okay, fair. I mean, but also, huh, interesting. Yeah. I need, to, yeah. Yeah. Um, I really need to continue the series that I, the serial that I started there, which is a, an offshoot of one of my books. Um, and I actually enjoy writing it, but I haven't published any chapters on it for ages, but I'm still getting these teeny tiny bonuses. I'm like, this is hilarious. No one's reading this. I'm not publishing anything and I'm getting an extra $10 a month. Well, that's not fair. They stopped giving me the bonuses. I, I was like, well, I'll just publish a whole bunch of chapters at once and try mm. to get a big bonus, but good idea. Didn't work. No, it mm. didn't work. They, they gave me zero because I, anyway, I, yeah, I think, I think what it is, is like, they think it's like a spammer or something. Oh, maybe. So maybe no it idea. triggered some bad algorithm. There's, <laughs> there's bots crawling all over it. There probably are. Every time Amazon does something new, there's a bajillion people trying to take advantage of it. So this is true. Yeah. And I was trying to take advantage of it. Well, no, but you were trying to like do so with a cereal, which is what they're asking you to do. Right. <laughs> like <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> Anyway, I mean, people taking advantage of it with bots, but <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah exactly. You're spamming thing, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll read the like the chat here. Um, if yeah, start. yeah, you have a few more minutes, and there's nothing after this, so we can go over if necessary. Okay, yeah, I mean, The Witcher, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like honestly, I have not read that series yet, I have not read it, I've watched mm-hmm. the the show on netflix um i'm enjoying the second season i thought they did a really good job with it 
I haven't watched the second season yet. And I really want to, but I haven't watched anything in so long. Well, yeah, I'm very critical of what they did with the Wheel of Time on Amazon Prime. But ah. The Witcher, if, if they had put that much production value and care into the Wheel of Time, it could have really been something. Hmm. Um, a little bitter about that. I, fair enough. I've heard a number of people say the same thing. I have never uh, been a Wheel of Time reader, so I cannot comment. Uh. <laughs> yeah, and I, the feeling of missing a window, boy, I have that big time. Um, <laughs> I, I really, I still kick myself for not self-publishing before uh, around 2010. <laughs> <laughs> Because I saw it coming. I saw all of it. I saw the rise of Hugh Howey, the, the rise of Amanda Hawking. Mm. I was watching it. I was like watching like a hawk <laughs> during that time. And, I, and instead of jumping on the bandwagon, like I should have, and I knew it in the back of my head, I was like, I should jump on this. I should do it right now. Mm. But then I was like, but I'm still querying agents and maybe one of them will read my book. Right. Yeah. Idiotic. Well, Idiotic. no, an easy trap to fall into, I think. And one that, you know, Trad Pub worked really hard to make sure people would. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Indy has turned a huge corner. God, I agree with that. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of everywhere is flooded right now. Um, mm-hmm. But I guess maybe the whole industry is changing in very strange ways, and it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I I think it's still true that you can find your audience and then that's, and then that's how you make a successful career out of it. It's, but it is much harder to find that audience. I agree. Like, so I've been kind of really interested watching the career of Drew Hayes Hmm. where he seems to have um, really kind of built an audience through online serialization. Hmm. And I've seen a few others like that. And that's kind of the route I'm taking right now because I find it, it's honestly just more fun. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it keeps me sane. It's like, yeah. I, I don't want to just dive into like the whole advertising, marketing, self promo thing mm. when I have zero readers and just like swapping newsletters and doing that whole. I, I know that's like the way that a lot of indie authors have made it and are making it, but oh my God, I, <laughs> it sounds like torture to me. <laughs> Well, everything in marketing is shifting right now. And so even the stuff that was working a year ago is not working right now. Uh, I'm in a few author groups with people who are far, 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 far more successful than I am. Um, And it's really interesting to hear what's working and what isn't in terms of marketing. AMS ads, Facebook ads, all the stuff that you could put money into and see some return on. Um, even like six months ago is now starting to become far less reliable. Facebook ads seem to be doing almost nothing for people. Um, AMS is on a steeply descending <laughs> uh, angle in terms of, of um, ROI. And it's, um, you know, <clears throat> I have no official data. I just have what I've heard in numerous author groups. And so um, even for established authors who are normally do, like, that's their bread and butter is just basic ads um, and getting in front of new readers that way. It's not, not working out for them. Um, but I am seeing a surge in Kickstarters and stuff for, oh, for people. Of Fred and Sanderson? No, even just before that. Um, but also, but also because of, of Brandon Sanderson. I mean, the truth is actually, I think I've seen like out of all the authors I know who've launched Kickstarters in the past couple of months, almost every single one of them was planned before Brandon Sanderson launched his surprise Kickstarters. So uh, surprise to the rest of us. Um, so yeah, uh, it's just that it's a, it's becoming a more, a more common tool than it was even a few years ago. Like I used it to launch my very first book back in 2014, but um, but I think other people are using it now to just do special editions or just, just do the audiobook or just do, um, or just do a pre-order that, that basically pays for all the costs. And, um, and that I think is, is a really useful tool for, for people who are worried about starting, um, with an audience or without. And, and if you have a following from working, from writing on Wattpad or something, I think it's a great way to leverage that, um, folks who are already excited about your work and love you as an author, um, 
hundred people can make a Kickstarter. Like <laughs> that's a uh... that's true, but Wattpad is like notoriously this is a free platform. So true. I, I don't yeah. necessarily want to be like, hey, come pay money to me. No, um, I, yeah, that 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 is understandable. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> What about getting known for one thing, using that to attract readers? An epic blog aggregator. I would like I would like there to be an epic blog aggregator for online serialization. I mean, I'm serializing mine on my own website, um, thanks to my husband who's a web developer. Ooh. Yeah. Um, and I'm using that, I'm linking it to Patreon basically. Mm, cool. Um, yeah, and I, I'm enjoying doing that. But there's yeah, it seems like more and more people are serializing online so that's probably the next big thing that's going to get flooded mm. if it isn't already mm-hmm. um yeah and like blogging i i found that i'm just not really enjoying blogging i thought i would and i have a blog but then i kind of stopped and now i think i better revamp my website to not have a blog on it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, there's the whole like Substack thing, which is basically blogging your fiction, and it seems to work for a bunch of people. So I, I have like I've kind of been considering using Substack in that way, but doing it on demand. So in other words, like I'll post a few chapters, and if I'm not getting any interest, I'm not going to post anymore. Hmm. Yeah, because I'm I'm just lazy. I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna play to like an audience of zero. Right. Understandable. I don't know if that's lazy. That just sounds like, you know, <laughs> wanting to have people actually read your stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you're going to go through the effort. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's cool. You've gotten quotes from big artists. Yes, I have been putting off the whole commission and artist thing, and I need to do that soon. <laughs> another another nice thing about kickstarter <laughs> yes fair enough i feel like i don't know with, with kickstarter i'd have to like drum up an audience and like i said i just don't feel comfortable asking for money from my wattpad audience that's totally understandable i have heard that you know the wattpad audiences are notoriously this is free and we like free and free is what we're here for. And it's all we're doing. And I get that. Um, but I feel like the lawyer, the loyal readers, I mean, I have a friend who writes exclusively web serials and um, or almost exclusively. And every time she releases something in a non serialized format, there's a, there's a core group of like 20 or 30 folks who always show up to buy it and they, they buy her artwork and they buy her other stuff. And I think um you know, it's, it's a, there is some conversion there with your, with the people who really just love the work and are ready to read anything you write They're they they might, sh- they'll show up and pay even though they're Wattpad readers, but. I've seen a few. Yeah. Like I've like, I did have one reader say, Hey, where's your Patreon? I'll re- I want to read ahead. Mm. That was when I opened up a Patreon. <laughs> nice. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I've, I've had a few asked to read ahead and and they are reading ahead on on patreon that's awesome yeah it is awesome and i'm really enjoying that so um ai assisted illustration there there already is a website that does that it's like oh yeah what's it called um everybody was playing with it like a month to a couple months ago i was playing with it yeah yeah Um, (laughs) like we all were like ai dreams or something weird like that i can't remember now oh yeah yeah Mm terrible for that but yeah so i'll say like i'm from the art world um i went through art school Mm. (laughs) i drew that (laughs) awesome Um, i was gonna ask if did you do all those all the character art yes oh that's awesome you're you do excellent work thank you yeah well i'm a little out of practice because uh being an artist isn't really all that lucrative (laughs) true <laughs> although i mean if you are good at just fantasy character art turns out 
uh, there is actually quite the market for it these days uh, amongst indie authors. So more and more. So yeah, I'm surprised. So maybe if I ever, you know, I might go back to that someday. Hmm. Um, but honestly, I'm pretty rusty and out of practice and I'm enjoying having a day job that pays pretty well. Well, that's good. So, anyway. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> I won't try to talk you out of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but no, I was, I, I did illustrate for a while for, I did mm-hmm. illustrate books. Um, and I mean, I was an animator on a lot of Nintendo games and that sort of thing. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I see like, I don't know. I still have some contacts in the art world and it's, it's a hard life to be an artist. I'll just put it that way. True. I think you could make the same argument for author, but all right. <laughs> you can, you can all the arts, all of them being an actor, yes. a musician, all of them. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I do, I see a lot of similarities between the art world and the writing world mm. in that way. Yeah. Wombo dream. That's the name of it. Yep. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Wombo. That's right. Yeah. Well, um, it is 10.06, um, and it's totally up to you if you want to wait for a couple more questions to come in or if you would like to wrap things up. Um, yeah, you're the yeah. last show of the day, so you can take a few extra minutes if you want. <laughs> I'll take a few extra minutes. Um, sorry, sure. my voice is like doing weird things now. No, that's <clears throat> yeah, probably because I had surgery yesterday. That seems like a thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Please take a moment. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Can you, can you draw this project to build your career? I have Mm. had so many people, including Mm. family members say like, why don't you just do a graphic novel of your epic series? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, you know how much effort it took me to write this? (laughs) <laughs> no, no, like times that by like 20. Right, exactly. Like there goes the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for attending. And sorry for my voice being weird. <laughs> oh, you are fine. That is like literally the first time it's caught at all. And after having surgery <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> you're quite excused. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> <sighs> Cool, cool, cool. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, and I'll... <laughs> right. Yeah, you do it for fun. Why should I pay? <laughs> right. Don't you enjoy it? If you enjoy it, why do I owe you money? <laughs> when I was in art school, like, there would be a notice board, and it would be like, um, seeking an artist for... Uh, I-, I forgot. It would always be like a child celebrity, a former child celebrity. <laughs> be launching a new project a new film project they'd be like i'm pitching to this and that tv studio and i just need an artist partner um to partner up. I'm, I'm the i was the um i was like the minor kid in the back of the room in punky brewster or that sort of <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> <sighs> yeah it, it was just like these washed up child actors <laughs> We're just looking for an artist to partner with and it was okay. always like they, they weren't paying it was just a right. great opportunity great opportunity so much exposure mm-hmm. just enough for you to die of yeah yeah I, I followed up on a few of those and it was always like really underwhelming mm. and I was like this pitch doesn't even sound very good to me and I'm, I'm just like a 18 year old artist so <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not interested I can't imagine the Hollywood execs are gonna be <laughs> right. uh <laughs> yeah. uh, excellent point delia because poverty isn't enjoyable yeah it is not yeah <laughs> approach me when we no longer live in a capitalist system if you would like me to produce art for free yeah <laughs> <sighs> Well, in the Torth Empire, everyone does things for free. Or ah, less. well, in in a good way. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> they're slaves. <laughs> oh dear. Oh no, mm-hmm. that's not what we're shooting for either. 
Да. <laughs> All right. Well, 1010, what do you think? Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'll see y'all tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you so much, Abby. This was uh, very enlightening. And um, thank you everyone to, who showed up. And if you have more questions, you can always pop them into the permanent comments, which will stay there forever. And um, Abby can maybe swing by and answer some more questions if you come up with them later. Um, thanks so much, Abby. And uh, I will in the, scre yeah, in the stream or the scream, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, right about now. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Okay, live stream.